Because August is Eat a Peach Month, this is a tip for the married men. It's time you go down on your wife. You're going to do it to the Eagles song, Take It Easy, Thank Me Later. At the end of the song that's playing in your head, she's going to be tearing your hair out. Stirring the coffee with the K-Bar Tactical Chopsticks using the Vortex Method, the only true way to optimize the taste of your coffee at the molecular level. Good morning. Welcome to the Daybreak Show. I am the Sultan. We'll get started, but first, coffee in a Daybreak coffee mug from Hardee's. Nice. Nice. Older women know how to treat a man. It's my observation. There, I said it. I said it. Guys, it gets better, and it really, really does. Young, cocky girls have zero clue. They think only of themselves, and they believe their beauty will last forever. And it's all vanity. We talked about that scripture, that charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that reveres the Lord will be praised. Older women walk much more humbly. You'll feel it in their kiss, their hug, their texts, see it in their eyes. Your hard work and effort will be appreciated. You'll be respected. Imagine that. They are a hundred times more grounded than younger women. There's a warmth that you get from them that you'll never get from a younger woman. Now you know, gentlemen, what you have to do. One guy says, agreed, but often hard to look at, unfortunately. That has not been my experience. I guess it all depends on how they have lived. You know, the face on a woman is like an odometer. It shows how many miles there are. However, a woman of character knows her nature and doesn't use it in a manipulative manner and, as always, believe her actions, not her words. Another fellow says, older women compete with a young woman's beauty. That is true because older women are always trying to look younger with everything from Botox to chemical peels to working out to trying to fit into the bikini. to It's all like a quest for youth. He says, the most touchy-feely people in the world are single women in their 40s, lol. Once a woman hits 40 and single, she stops playing hard to get. That's not been my experience. If they're pretty and have a good figure and no children, they still act like they're hard to get and they act choosy well into their late 40s and mid 50s. They start getting humble in about their mid 50s. That's what I noticed if they have pretty girl syndrome. Just a reminder that your first reaction to everything is always 100% emotional. Everything. Think about the things that you've done. I think about the things that I've done, how I've responded. Your first reaction to everything, doesn't matter what it is, is always emotional and not rational. You say and think things in that moment that you probably will regret saying when you look back on it. Here's an answer to that. And I've done it. Here's an answer. Do nothing or do the opposite. Email me if you need to. Lauren Chen says, my apparent hot take, if you would move cities, even countries for a job, she's speaking to women, then you should be willing to move for a relationship. Who you marry is way more important than any job could ever be. And I reposted that with a comment. And I said, if she's not willing to move, then there's no love, period, regardless of what she says. You could hear, I love you every day for years in any, any kind of long distance relationship or short distance relationship. If she's not willing to pack, there's no love. Again, circling back to believe what a woman does and nothing of what she says. It's just a great general rule. I had to laugh yesterday on the news. I saw something coming out of the White House that said white supremacy is the biggest threat to America right now. White supremacy and climate change. Can't make that shit up. You really can't. Crime statistics. Looking back on some memories, teaching is my absolute favorite job. And teaching for institutions is not possible right now. So I do it here. I've taught psych in five colleges and two barbering and cosmetology academies, beauty academies. Here's a picture of me teaching what I call my students, my girls, at a Paul Mitchell Beauty Academy which I think if you are thinking of going into the hair industry, Paul Mitchell schools are probably the best that there is. There is nothing better. The protocol is amazing. They, they call themselves future professionals, not students. 
And I don't want to say it's military-like, but there is a protocol there. There's a respect there that you see there that you won't find in any other beauty school from what I've seen, and I've been to many. So if you are thinking of going into the hair industry, look for a Paul Mitchell school. It's the best of the best. Anyone here have a Leatherman multi-tool? Man, I have one that I've had for decades, decades, with the leather snap sheath, you know, sticks on your belt. Incredible. This thing is just amazing. It's a classic one. And I'll tell you what, it's got all the tools that I need. The only thing this one doesn't have on is scissors. And I'm just going to leave the scissors to the, the Swiss Army knives. This is an amazing tool. It's got a knife, a saw, two screwdrivers, a bottle opener, a Phillips head screwdriver. What else? A file. Just pretty much basic. I love it. Oh, and these pliers. I've used these pliers for so many things. They're not springed. In other words, they don't have that spring action in them. That's how old this thing is. The new ones, I think, do have a spring action in them. But I have used this for decades now. It's one of the first ones I ever put out. Unbelievable. I'll put a link for it down below. The new ones are just a little bit different. They're still pretty rugged. But every guy needs to have one of these. And I even think that they make the uh, sheath in, like, nylon Kevlar or Cordura or something like that, but I, I tend to like leather. Here's a little tip. When you start to enjoy your own company and are somewhat comfy with solitude, which I have been for years, then there is no hurry to want to fill that space with anything inferior, even an inferior woman. Nothing wrong with what I call friendius platonicus. Every male-female relationship doesn't have to lead to something let your heart find its bearings and reset the internal compass. One person's loser might be another person's knight in shining armor and vice versa. Guys, you've had some sour experiences. I know that. I have too. But don't let it ruin you for anyone in the future. Your gifts can be appreciated by someone else. Okay, so she dumped you. She divorced you. She doesn't want to see you anymore. Don't allow that to affect your self-esteem. For the longest time, I thought, man, I got to just tap out of this. It's me. I don't have what it takes. I got to say this again. There are good women out there. There are good men out there. Know everybody's nature. Just be aware of that. We don't have to elaborate on that. There's entire men's movements and channels based upon women's nature, which is a little narrow-sighted. But that little that little narrow-sighted thing can affect our lives so much, or we should, should I say, we've allowed it to affect us much. Carries a lot of weight, doesn't it? It's a big part of our lives. So if you need to take a break, take a break. But don't let one person's actions sour you for other people who might appreciate you. Remember what I said. I don't believe... I never believe a woman when she says that she loves me. Never. I believe a woman when she says she appreciates me and respects me. And they show that through their actions. A woman won't say, I respect you. Very few will. And it, it's almost become like a meme and joking with this channel. You know, I respect you. That kind of thing. I get that. I'll never forget a woman telling me she appreciates me. You might as well shot me up with testosterone and pumped me up, man, because I felt like I could take on the world at that point. To be appreciated for your efforts? Are you kidding me? You actually recognize that I work hard? You actually recognize that I do things to keep this relationship happy? You realize that I bite my tongue when you are emotional? Yeah, being appreciated, that's pretty cool. Had a coaching session yesterday not where I was the coach, but where I was the coach E. I was the student. One of the first questions the coach asked was, the methods that you're using right now, how are they working for you? What are your goals? My goal is to make 83K a month. It's my goal. It's not going to happen doing what I'm doing. It's gonna, what I'm doing is contributing to that, but that alone is not going to help me reach my goal. So why do we keep doing something if it's not working? I've always loved this meme, the lights on in this condo, this beach condo, 
and an arrow pointing to the top condo. It says entrepreneur. And man, that is true. There's two things here. The most expensive condo belongs to an entrepreneur, not someone who has a job. The best view always belongs to the entrepreneur, not the guy that just goes to a nine to five. Absolute fact. And the other thing is this. I've noticed that in this meme, the lights are out in so many of the other units, but the entrepreneurs stay up and work. And there's no such thing as, what do they say, career and life balance. There's no such thing as that. I know. I never turn off, coach, ever. I don't turn it off. When I cut hair a couple days a week, I turn that on. I turn that off. But when it comes to coaching, I never turn that off. I'm constantly, constantly in coaching mode. Do you work the kind of career where you turn on and off, clock in and out? Here's 18 movies that every entrepreneur should watch. And I'll ask you this. How many of these have you seen? Startup.com. Catch me if you can. Lord of War. Wall Street. Rogue Trader. That's from 1999. 12 Angry Men. Office Space. The Godfather Trilogy. The Usual Suspects. In 2005, there was a movie called The Smartest Guys in the Room. called How to Get Ahead in Advertising. Just find it. Just find it. The Devil Wears Prada. Thank You for Smoking. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Absolute classic. Coffee is for Closers. The Merchant of Venice. It's probably one of Al Pacino's greatest films. Now that you know these things, watch these movies again. I'll put a link for this article down below. See that you will learn something different from them. You won't just be watching them for entertainment. Aaron Brockovich. The founder, one day after uploading a very popular video, a young man contacts me and says he wants to teach and be able to speak like me. I told him he could do that, but it would cost him. I asked him how much was he willing to sacrifice? How many nights would he sit up late and read? How many mornings would he get up before work to read for two to three hours? What seems easy and effortless to me is the result of hours, weeks, months, and years, decades of hard work. Why do I speak the way that I do? How do I speak the way that I do? How do I do that? It seems effortless to me, doesn't it? I started recording my voice on a reel-to-reel tape recorder at eight years old. I still have that reel. When I get my mail, I open up my mail and I read it out loud. That's one of the techniques that I use to develop my voice over the years. Read my mail out loud. I'll give you another pro tip. Learn to enunciate your words, which means that you're moving your jaw and your lips. You're not just having like this. You're not just having the lips move. If you want to learn how to speak better, I can help you with that with one session. It's expensive, but so is not learning how to talk. And again, another reminder that you didn't fall in love. You didn't. You fell in love with the idea of what that person would be like with you in the future. Marriage is a covenantal sacrament that keeps you from running for when that feeling wears off. That's why the covenant is so important. Those of us who have been through divorce, one of the things that that makes us just flabbergasted is that the other party gave up on the covenant when things got hard or when they changed their mind. Again, believe actions, never words. Just wrapped up five months of executive presence coaching with a corporate client. And I'll tell you the areas that we covered. Number one, executive presence in a boardroom and a pitch setting. Two, commanding respect in meetings without looking like you're trying to get respect. Number three, vocal clarity and peak vocal skills for executives. Four, verbal visibility. You can actually stand out with the way that you talk. Five, color choice. What colors look best on you? Six, grooming. I know a little bit about that. Seven, out of the box, thinking about clients. Think out of the box about your clients. What's going on in their head? Eight, coaching direct report staff with SCI meetings, which I created probably 30 years ago. SCI stands for sharing concerns and ideas. When I 
was a clinical director, I would have quarterly meetings with my staff, one at a time, individual meetings, SCI meetings, where they would share concerns and ideas. That's, that's their turn to talk and my turn to listen. Number nine, regularly updating resume and your skills list. When I see someone who has a resume, oh, I graduated in 1997 from such and such university, whatever. Okay. Was that the last time you learned anything? I want, because I believe that education is a lifelong process to stay fresh, stay relevant, you need to show me your history of learning, not when you last learned. Number 10, keeping everyone informed of your skills. For instance, I just became a certified advanced grief and loss therapist. I have that certification that I just got this year. And I want everyone to know about it. Number 11, Google alerts for your name and your corporate identity. Number 12, recommendations on LinkedIn and using it to your advantage. Number 13, developing your team. There's no I in team, right? 14, teaching mentoring down the chain of command. You're not just mentoring people. You are teaching people how to be mentors. Remember, everybody, everybody is a teacher and everybody is a student. It's a lot of work if you have to teach everybody down the line. What you want to do is take your direct reports, the people that report to you, and teach them how to teach. You are modeling for them how to teach the people that they work with. 15, making yourself irreplaceable, which I think is more and more relevant as the years go on. We're seeing so many jobs being replaced by technology, AI. Even Hollywood is now like... There was actually a meeting, some kind of like union, a SAG meeting, SAG, Screen Actors Guild meeting where, with Brian Cranston teaching where he was behind a microphone saying something like AI, like AI is not going to take our jobs away from us or something like that. Yes, it is. Number 16, corporate individuation. How do you be different than everyone else in the corporation? Listen. I have taught guys and gals this, just simple, simple techniques. I say stomach in, chest out, shoulders back, head held high, walk 25% faster. That's it. If you do that, you will literally separate yourself from the herd. Let me say it again. Stomach in, chest out, shoulders back, head held high, walk 25% faster than Everybody. Do that for a month. See what happens. Number 17, reboot as me incorporated and identify your core values, your skills, your public perception. Oh, I work for this company. Okay. So you're identifying with the company. You are a company. I'll never forget back in 1992 two or 91, Cindy Crawford, the supermodel said, I am the CEO of a corporation that offers a very hot product called Cindy Crawford. Exact quote. She said, I never wake up looking like Cindy Crawford. You are a product of me incorporated. What are the core values? What is the image of you? incorporated. Number 18, building rapport at all levels up and down. Can you talk to the janitor, the guy that sweeps the floors, as well as the vice presidents and the CEO? Number 19, pre-plan responses to all scenarios versus reacting. Hmm. Even in the corporate culture, remember what I said early in this show, that everybody's reactions are 100% emotional and not rational. Everybody. It's not just in your home and in your personal relationships. It's even at work. When you realize that everybody that you work with, everybody, are reacting emotionally, you know how you stand above everyone else? Be rational. In a world of emotional people, that's how you stand out. Number 20, attitude of gratitude. I know that sounds like a meme, right? For employment, 
in any economy, be thankful. It's interesting when you're thankful for your work and you actually have gratitude for the opportunity to be able to serve and lead. It's an opportunity. You're getting to do that. It shows and it's magnetic with people. Number 21, I actually taught how to have a power breakfast and brain food for optimum morning meeting effectiveness. Yesterday I was asked a question, what do I do about brain fog? One of my students asks me, what do I do about brain fog? I wake up in the morning and the first thing I feel is just like this brain fog and, and coffee does not wake you up. Let me tell you what wakes you up. This right here. Take a pint glass. Get yourself a pint glass. Do I have to put an Amazon link down below for you to, have a, to get a pint glass? You know, the kind you get in a bar. Fill it up with pure water, filtered water, whatever. First thing you do, first thing you do, when you leave your bedroom, go to the kitchen, fill up a glass of water, slam it, the whole thing. Or if you're a bottled water person, slam a bottle of water. Brain fog goes away in 10 to 15 minutes. Disappears. You awake without coffee. So first thing I do is 16 ounces of water. Do it before I even make coffee. Have a glass of water, big glass of water, not a little glass. Have 16 ounces of water every morning. First thing you do when you wake up, you'll see a difference almost immediately. Number 22, top three concerns, confidence, vocal volume, visibility, and the lack of dynamic presence. And that was what I was working with this client was his confidence, his vocal volume and visibility and lack of dynamic presence. When you walk in a room, when you do a meeting, when you conduct a teaching session, are people listening or are they doodling? Are they scrolling on their phones? I learned this being a director for years and of course being a stage presenter for most of my adult life. What does your presence command? Does it command attention? Or are people doing other tasks while you're talking? Or 23, transference of enthusiasm skills, which is basically just sales. How do you sell yourself? Be enthusiastic. Nothing happens. My father taught me this. Nothing happens until somebody gets enthusiastic. Number 24, a smile spot. And being on before you have to. I remember when I was in the acting world for five years, I did that. Modeling, acting, commercial acting, that kind of stuff. I distinctly remember before I would walk into the building or the room where I would have to do an audition, I remember identifying a smile spot. It could be the doormat. It could be a doorknob. could be the, you know, the frame around the door, anything like that. And I would just look at it and think, smile spot. And instantly, I would smile. Instantly. Instantly. Stomach in, chest out, shoulders back, head held high. So when I walked through the door, I didn't walk in with a straight face, and all of a sudden, didn't do that. I walked in in a good mood. If it's a railing going upstairs, there's your smile spot. Think about it. Identify a smile spot and automatically allow it to straighten you out. There's a, see, see what I just did with my body? Here's me just kind of like slouching in front of the microphone and then watch. Looks a little different, doesn't it? Number 25, organic versus forced or pressured growth. Organic growth is the best. And 26, brand leadership through teamwork and everyone singing the same tune. That's what I did in executive presence coaching for this client. And again, it's a good morning to all the builders out there who will glorify God and create something that will outlive them, men and women. Good morning to my builders. Here's a picture of me 20 years ago, 260 pounds, heading for a health disaster. Get your lab work done. Even though I was, I still had muscles, I still carried a lot of weight, a lot of weight. 260 pounds. All right, so I'm like about one. Well, I know I'm under 188 now. Stepped on the scale and I was 188. Last Friday I was 188. I'm probably 186 right now. Just really super lean, feel good, zero belly. Someone said to me, man, don't lose any more weight. 
It's funny. I'm not even trying. All it's just it's about lifestyle. Twenty years ago, I was 260 pounds, heading for a health disaster. Got my lab work done. Lab work is your real health. That tells the real story. Your blood work. Go to your doctor. Get all the great lab work done. If it if you're a guy. Dude, you got to get your hormones checked. You got to get your testosterone checked. You have to get your prostate checked. The real health is what your blood says, not how you look. Keep that in mind. I didn't look bad 20 years ago, but inside, it was pretty bad. And with that, finish your coffee, and I'll see you on the next Daybreak Show, your home of sanity, clarity, and reason.